Today we shall look at image receptors. My name is Dr. Kihara. So uh, what will be the outline of this lecture? We'll be looking at the types of analog image receptors. And we look at the digital image receptors uh, later. Then uh, components of the image receptors, then uh, characteristics of a uh, radiographic film, and then uh, image formation, and finally the references. So these uh, will be the objectives of this uh, lecture. So objective one would be to know the different types of analog image receptors and to describe the components of uh, each image uh, receptor. Then you should be able to outline the main characteristics of the radiographic uh, field. And uh, you should also be able to describe the interaction of the X-rays with the film emulsion. So uh, looking at the types of uh, analog image receptors, we are going to look at two types. One of them is direct action or non-screen film as I demonstrated in that uh, picture. So these are direct action or non-screen uh, packet uh, film. They are sensitive to X-ray photons. So the film is put inside the packet film that is uh, demonstrated in the image shown. So we use them for various intraoral uh, radio radiographic techniques. So one of them is the intraoral periapical, the bite wings, and the occlusal radiographs. So they provide excellent image quality and uh, they're able to give you fine anatomical details. So they come in various sizes. We have one that measures that one times 41 millimeters, that's for the intraoral periapical. Then we have for bite wings is 22 by 35 millimeters. And we have one for the occlusal radiographs, which is a bit large, which is 57 by 76 millimeters. And for the bite wings, we can also have uh, one that's a bit longer than uh, the standard, and we use it to take long bite wings. So you're able to get all the teeth from the premolars to the third molars. So what are the components of the film packet? So the film packet usually has an outer packet, which is a wrapper. And this is non-absorbent paper or uh, plastic. Then uh, it has a white surface. It may be pebbled or could be smooth. The one shown is a smooth. And this is the side that faces the X-ray, the source of the X-ray. Then we have the reverse side, has two colors. Uh, look at that, this one has a white and another color. So that is a reverse side. And it must be placed uh, correctly at any one time. Otherwise, you'll get an error if you reverse the way it's supposed to be put. So these are the contents of that film packet. And uh, the colors are sometimes different. You can get dark ones, blue ones, white, and other colors. So the, the contents of the film packet, we have a black paper inside. And this black paper covers the film. So that's the film. 
and then we have a black paper on either side that one and and that one shown uh, by the laser pointer then uh after the this are uh, black paper to protect the fume from light and damage by fingers and saliva so those fume packets you should handle them carefully you shouldn't uh, bed them and they should not be opened before exposure and and should also not be opened in, uh, before uh, you switch off the lights and you have the right uh, uh, lights on uh, from there then uh, we have a lead foil this lead foil is uh, placed on one side of that uh, packet and has an embossed pattern on it and this appears on the resultant radiograph when the film packet is placed in the wrong way so uh, when uh, you see the pattern on the radiograph then you know that you placed it in the wrong way so these are uh, lead foil is placed behind the film and this prevents residual radiation that has passed through the film from continuing on into the patient's tissues so we have uh, the x-rays we expose it to the fume and then on the other side of the fume so we have that uh, lead foil that's now protect protecting uh, the patient from getting the residue radiation it also prevents scattered secondary radiation from coming back to the fume and degrading the image so whatever is scattered and uh, it's reflected back uh, to the to the film then it doesn't pass that lead foil so you don't have chances of degrading the image okay now we can focus on the radiographic film the film itself so you've seen the components that uh, wrap that uh, film and keep it safe so now we look at that film itself. It's very thin, but it has various uh, components. So it has four basic components. It has a plastic base made of a clear transparent cellulose acetate, which acts as a port for the emulsion. And then after that, we have an adhesive. And this fixes the emulsion to the base. So um, that's a diagram. So in the middle there, you can see the plastic base. Then after the plastic base, you have the adhesive on both sides. Then after that, you have the emulsion. Emulsion still is on both sides. And these are silver halide crystals. Then that emulsion is covered by the protective layer of gelatin on both sides. So that emulsion is a very important part of the film. So component number three will be the emulsion. As you said, as we have said, it's put on both sides of the film and consists of silver halide crystals, which are embedded in a gelatin matrix. Then fourthly, we have the protective layer of gelatin that now protects that emulsion from any mechanical damage. So you must protect it because that's where the image forms. So if it is uh, destroyed then or damaged, then you're not going to form an image. And if you form an image, you're going to see errors on those images. So that emulsion will be very important. Now we come to the second type of uh, image receptors, and these are called indirect action or screen film. And these are used together with intensifying screens and the film is placed in a cassette. So what is demonstrated there is a cassette. It's like a small box, a casing. And in this uh, casing, this is what we call the cassette. So this cassette has been opened. So when you open it and you place the film inside, so as you notice, it's quite a uh, huge. So this is for extra oral radiographic techniques. 
you don't uh, uh yeah you don't put this one inside the the mouth it's quite huge so it's put on there on the uh either it's put on the in the machine especially for the panoramic uh, images and then now uh, you position the patient in a way that the position now corresponds with where you have placed the film so that to be able to form the image when the x-rays are passed through the patient and then they they are received by the film which is inside the cassette and this uh, film is sensitive to light photons which are emitted by the adjacent intensifying screens so this cassette inside it has something that we call screens on both sides and these screens are the ones that emit light once you uh, expose them to x-rays and then that light then now is used to form the image on the film so what are the advantages so uh, this indirect action or screen film they respond to a short exposure of x-rays so that is the idea of having the intensifying screens so you expose a patient to uh, uh, less x-rays and then the intensifying screens are going to intensify now that uh, the effect and they're going to help informing the image by producing light which now is focused on the film and then the film now forms the image so this enables a lower dose of radiation to be used so that you can protect the patient from excessive uh, radiation exposure but the disadvantage is that the image has an inferior quality as compared to the to the other to the intraoral films so the quality in terms of the contrast and the resolution so these indirect action or screen films are used for extra oral projections and the construction of the indirect action film is similar to the direct action film so it also has the an emulsion which is designed to be sensitive primarily to light rather than to x-rays so for the direct action film those films are sensitive to x-rays while the emulsion in the in these are indirect action uh, film they are sensitive to light and this light is emitted by the intensifying screens and these screens can either emit a uh, blue green or red light so uh, those films for the indirect action or screen film they may have uh, various types of emulsions um, one of them could be standard silver halide emulsion that's sensitive to blue light and then another chromatic emulsion which is sensitive to green light you can also have panchromatic emulsion which is sensitive to red light so they all give will give you the same image so it just depends on the one that you choose or the one that is used in your institution and remember that that light is produced when the when that film is exposed to uh, when the intensifying screens are exposed to x-rays they emit light and that light is projected onto the film and that is what helps in forming the image the and the intensifying screens consist of our fluorescent phosphors eg calcium tungstate and uh, rare earth screens so they emit light when excited by x-rays and uh, it's embedded on a plastic matrix. So two screens are used, one at the front, one at the back. The front screen will absorb the low 
energy x-ray photons and uh, vice versa. The screens will then convert the x-rays into visible light by the photoelectric effect. Then the, the light photons will affect the motion of the film and will form an image. Unless radiation is used. However, the resolution is uh, decreased. We'll be looking at uh, the meaning of for those words. What does a resolution mean? When we look at the characteristic of the of the films, the characteristics of the images formed on the films. So the cassettes that now uh, we are talking about. This is a light tight aluminium container. So it's made of aluminium and it contains the intensifying screen. So when you are ready to do the radiograph, you just uh, put the film inside, and this is done in a dark room so that the film is not exposed to, to X-rays. And once you're done, you just remove it and keep the cassette. When you get another patient to pick the cassette, you place the film inside, and then you expose the patient. OK. So next, we look at the characteristics of a radiographic film. One of them uh, is optical density. We just look at a just brief description of what that means. So this describes the degree of film blackening. And it is measured with densitometer. It ranges from 0 0.25 to 2.5. So how is the optical density calculated? So it is a log of the incident light, light intensity divided by the transmitted light intensity. Next, we look at something called a characteristic curve. So these are graph that shows the variation in optical density with different exposures. So as exposure increases, optical density also increases so you can draw a curve if a curve whereby you <clears throat> you expose the film to a different amounts of uh, of radiation so as you increase the exposure the optical density is also going to increase that means the film or the image that you're looking at will become darker that's why you have to know how much uh, of that uh, radiation you're supposed to expose a certain film to, because when you give excess, um, give excess, then you're going to have an image that is too dark and you can't distinguish between different structures. Then there's something called background fog uh, density. This is a small degree of blackening evident, even with zero exposure. So even before you take a you take a, a radiograph, before you uh, yeah before you do your X-rays and uh, form the image on the film, that particular film even when it is new, sometimes you can get a small degree of a blackening. It becomes a little bit dark, and this is due to the color or the density of the plastic base, and also development of some unexposed silver halide crystals. And sometimes if you don't uh, store, it, uh, store the fumes properly and they get exposed to light, you will find that the edges start to, to darken because they have gotten exposed to light. So this is supposed to be less than 0.2. So that's the fog background for density. Then there is also something called a film speed. This is the exposure required to produce an optical density of one above the background fog. So we talk about uh, 
film speed and you can talk about faster film. So a faster film will require less exposure, hence lower radiation dose. And this is a function of the number and the size of the silver halide crystals in the emulsion. So if you have uh, large crystals, then uh, the film speed will be faster, although there will be poor image quality. So we have different speeds of films. We have D, E, or F speed for intraoral radiography. So the F speed is faster than the D. And uh, the faster the, the speed, then the less will be the exposure. So this can be one of the ways you can use to protect the patient from excessive radiation by using fumes with a faster speed. So whenever you're using the, those uh, fumes, then it's important for you to know whether you're using D and F and how much should you, how much exposure should you give. So mostly we vary the seconds. So if uh, it's a D speed, then uh, more time will be required. If it's F speed, then less time will be required uh, for you to expose the patient to the x-rays. Then there's something called film sensitivity. This is a reciprocal of the exposure required to produce an optical density of one above the background fog. So the first film has high sensitivity. Then uh, there's also film latitude. And this one is a measure of the range of exposure that produces distinguishable differences in optical density. So if you have wider film latitude, you have a greater range of object density uh, that, may be, that may be seen. So that's uh, all about the film uh, sensitivity and film latitude. Then there's film contrast. And this is a difference in optical density between two points on a film that have received different exposures. So uh, a film which has a, a better contrast or a high contrast, you're able to distinguish uh, different tissues. Just you're able to tell this is dentin and this is enamel. But where we have poor contrast, the dentin and the enamel will look the same. So this is like the degree of, of the grayness of that, uh, of, of the image that you're looking at. So if it's high contrast, then you're able to see different shades of that grayness and that helps you in distinguishing between different tissues. Then a resolution. A measure of the radiographs, ability to differentiate between different structures that are close together. So the better the resolution, the better, the better the image, the better the interpretation. And this is affected by image sharpness, that is a penumbra effect. And the size of the silver halide crystals, the contrast. So direct action view has better resolution. So you're able to distinguish between dif uh, different structures that are close together. So you can tell the differences between the bone, the lamina dura, the periodontal ligament space, the cementum, the enamel. So the better the resolution, yeah, the better the image. So the intraoral images, they have better resolution than the extra oral images. And finally, we can talk about the film storage. So you keep them in a cool, dry place 
and away from any radiation, whether it is light or whether it's X-rays, and also away from chemical fumes uh, like uh, mercury. When you're doing the amalgam sealing, they shouldn't be nearby, and then they should be kept in boxes which are placed on their edges just to prevent the pressure effect. And this is especially for the extra oral films. Then finally, we'll be looking at the image formation. How do you form the images on those films? We've seen uh, the components of the films. Then how does image form in those uh, films? So this is all about the interaction of the X-rays and the emulsion. So formation of the latent image. How is the latent image formed? So the object absorbs X-rays. So, so you expose the patient to the X-rays. And then the X-rays, uh, they will either be absorbed or they're going to uh, pass through the patient, the patient tissues and changed. Then from there, they will reach the film. When they reach the film, they will pass through the emulsion of the silver halide crystals to form the latent image. So the silver halide crystal one crystal contains iodide ion, has bromide ion, silver ion, and free interstitial silver ions, and a latent image site. So I'll show you a diagram, and this is the diagram of one crystal. So it has uh, all the ions that we have mentioned, and it has this area which we call the latent image site, and we'll see what happens in that crystal. So an emulsion or a film has thousands and millions of our crystals. So that's another view of the crystal with the iodide ion, bromide ion, some bromine atoms there, has silver ion, there's a interstitial ion that's in between the other ions and then a latent image site. So that is one crystal. So the interaction of the X-ray photon with the silver halide crystals is as follows. So the X-ray photon, that's the X-ray photon, knocks off an electron from the bromide ion. So it goes to the bromide ion, it knocks off the electron. So when it knocks off an electron, the bromide ion, then it's converted to its neutral form, it remains a bromine atom. You remember it has seven electrons on the outer shell. So it had received one electron to become an ion. So that electron is now uh, ejected from that ion. So it becomes an atom. So where does it go to? So the free ion, it moves to the latent image site where they become trapped and uh, they impart a negative charge on that site. So that site becomes negatively charged. Remember, we are talking about what happens in a crystal once it interacts with the X-rays. So now the latent image has become negatively charged. So then you get a uh, it attracts the a positive interstitial silver ion. So this is attracted to the latent image uh, site. And that uh, silver atom, uh, I mean the silver ion, you will receive an electron and to form a silver atom at the latent image site. 
So the neutral silver atom at each site renders the crystals sensitive to fume processing chemicals. So once now uh, that silver has become neutral, it renders that particular crystal sensitive to the image processing chemicals. And so that when you uh, put now the fume in the chemicals, you're able to process uh, that fume and you end up forming an image on the fume. So this is happening, this will happen to various crystals. So remember there are some crystals that are not going to receive any X-ray photons because uh, the X-rays were absorbed. For, like now, for example, bone, bone absorbs the X-ray photons. Uh, something like enamel and dentin, they are also going to ab absorb, but they have various densities. So they will uh, absorb different amounts of the X-ray photons and some photons may, may go through. So if it is a pulp tissue, which is a uh, soft tissue, it is not going to absorb any significant photon. So those photons will go through and, the, and they will they're going to affect the crystals. So where that image uh, forms, so where the photons have been able to go through the tissues and has gone to the other side of the film, so they are going to render those crystals sensitive. And therefore, when you're processing, you're going to see the differences in the manner in which the film absorbed various photons. So we're going to continue with the processing uh, processing of fumes later. Yeah, so what happens, the areas where we have the silver, the silver atoms, uh, so they become dark, so you process it. So crystals that are not sensitized are normally removed, so those areas usually appear like they are, they are light or like they are radio opaque. So we shall continue with the processing of the of the images and find out how the chemicals, the processing chemicals, interact with those fumes that are having some sensitized areas and other areas that are have no have no sensitized crystals. Thank you. <laughs>